there. Welcome to the Firewatch audio tour. My name is Rich Summer. I voiced the character of Henry, the guy that you're currently controlling with those buttons there. And I'll be chatting with you in a little bit. Thanks for checking it out. Hi, I'm Sean Vanneman. I wrote the bulk of 100% of this game. <laughs> hey, I'm Jake Rodkin. I did a lot of level design, UI design, and uh, worked with everyone on the story for Firewatch. The game has this weird structure that Chris and I talk about in another tape. This is the first thing I wrote, was this opening of the game that jumps between Henry's life and the trip out to the woods. And I used a little product called Twine to do that, which you can download and use. It's just a very simple choose your own adventure tool. The simplest way to program a video game that one can then share with friends and play. Um, I think we were worried that the team would sort of perceive Henry as a blank slate, as sort of a generic game player protagonist, and we wanted to make sure, or we wanted to get in everyone's mindset, you're playing as a specific guy with a specific life. Yeah, there's a reason when you play video games that a lot of your uh, protagonists have amnesia because uh, it's really difficult when you're driving a character around uh, who knows things about their life or his or her life that you, who you ostensibly are that person, don't know. So, yeah, um, we kept trying to write an opening of the game that happened sort of like weeks into Henry's experience and then quickly realized that it was like, well, why would he not be able to say X? Well, because his relationship with his wife is Y. So, but the player doesn't know that. Yeah. And this was the quickest way to get everybody on board, was to just take the thing that I wrote that answered the question, I think, for Jane and you at the beginning, which was like, who is Henry? And I would write these character profiles that were really bad. 
and then I went, ah, what if I just let you play a thing? And then you can figure out who he is. And we held on to that until we had the idea to put into the game. It means that when you're playing Firewatch and Henry and Delilah start talking about Henry's wife, you don't have to learn it through his dialogue because you made the choices that brought him where he is today. Hi, it's Jake again. Hey, I'm Chris Remo. Oh, hey, Chris. Hi there. I was a game designer and the music composer on Firewatch. Nice. So you're hearing now the first piece of interactive music that went into Firewatch, the first piece of music that actually responds to what you're doing in the game. Exactly, yeah. So this is a piece of music that's divided into um, technically six parts. And what's happening is as you're playing through this introductory sequence, um, when you hit certain points in the narrative, it sends a signal to WISE, which is the name of the audio middleware we're using, and then when WISE gets that signal, it waits until the next sort of musically appropriate transition point, and then when it hits that, it smoothly transitions into the next section of music, and so it creates the effect that you're just listening to one big long piece of music that just happens to be timed very nicely it just happens, to your playthrough. It just happens to get sadder and sadder at the exact rate <laughs> that your life gets sadder and sadder. Yeah, exactly. Th this was a challenging process, both because I had no idea what the music should, should sound like, and also because it was the first interactive piece of music in the game, so the, the technical sort of just how does this work was, was also a part of it. I, but as it turned out, this music was changed, I mean, Jake, you may remember this, this music changed relatively little over the course of development yeah, in I comparison think, to a lot of I other think we, it started off as maybe three pieces and it expanded out to five over mm -hmm. development, but other than that, it's, yeah, one of the first things dropped in, yeah. shift. Get ready to hear about that a lot on this commentary. <laughs> Thank you. 
I'm Nels Anderson, and I was a designer and gameplay programmer on Firewatch. I am Jane Ng, and I worked on the 3D environment art in Firewatch. So, you're likely standing at the base of... your your home away from home. You're home in the wilderness. <laughs> <laughs> For all intents and purposes, more or less, this is basically just a real straight up tower mm -hmm. like they existed out in the woods right yeah i think some i think it's portland there's somebody in portland who uh, was very good about archiving a lot of uh you know blueprints about various type of fire lookouts of you know of of the state and we got some and uh so we that's how we started off building the firewatch i mean the lookout tower just by looking through how they were actually built it's slightly taller than a real one right we had to make quite a bit of adjustments because for example the stairway you see here normally fire lookout stairways are not on the outside but you know for more interesting gameplay and uh, views for the player we opted to change that but you know ultimately we still wanted the tower to feel like a real tower so mm -hmm. we had to figure stuff like hey how does the plumbing actually work how do right. they get water? You know, stuff like that it actually is very important for a real tower. And if you go, like, look around the base of the tower, you'll actually see a big old plastic <laughs> cistern. <laughs> you know, we are not a survival game of any sort, but it is important to make sure that, like, all that stuff is actually thought out so the space feels realistic. Right. You don't, you don't want someone playing the game being like, wait a minute. There's no, how, do, how does this guy drink? How is he not dead? When I normally play video games, I'm always interested in stuff like, hey, where's the bathroom? You know, so, you know, here we have the outhouse and you can go anywhere, but stuff like water is very important. So in a real, in a real fire lookout situation, what they do is they will use um, like a cistern and they will capture rainwater from the roof. And you will actually see that we actually have a little pipe down from the roof. And we even have what they call a first flush filter being there, which is actually what they use. That, I mean, that's my favorite kind of filter, really. <laughs> yeah, I had to look up well, what, like, what do they do? Because like, once you go, okay, you collect roof, like uh, rainwater from the roof, but won't it be all nasty? And then, oh, hey, somebody already figured that out on how to collect rainwater. What do you know? We actually visited um, a number of different lookout towers as we were like researching the game. And it was always very satisfying to see elements of things we saw in the real world and uh, make their way back into the game and vice versa. So we also made sure to have a tab here, like a little faucet where you can actually get water from the cistern. <laughs> yeah, if you click on it, it will play an animation of a hand gripping a <laughs> knob and water comes out for two seconds. It doesn't do anything, Yeah, but it's there. I think for a while we actually were thinking like, should we just let the player turn on the water but then what happens if the water just runs out and then james, right. <laughs> and then james had a very good idea of just going like oh just make one animation that you turn on the faucet and turn it off immediately just so that you know hey there's water in here and you won't die that's henry Two Forks Tower, this is Thoroughfare Tower, come in. I know you're there, your lights are on. Hello, Two Forks, come back. Pick up your radio. Um, hello? Whoever this is? It's Henry, right? Yeah. I'm Delilah. Yeah, that's what the guy said on the phone. So, what's wrong with you? Excuse me? People take this job to get away from something. So, what's wrong? What's wrong with you? That's a great idea. Go ahead. 
Look, I just hiked for two days, so I don't really follow whatever it is you're doing right now. You take a stab at what's wrong with me. Fine, then can I... What, sleep? Forever? Sure, buddy. Okay, now go ahead. Okay, you're probably out here because nobody back home can stand you. Which, after this brief introduction, is not a big shock. Ouch! Uh, I'll chalk that up to you being tired and grumpy. Well, I'd better get some sleep then. One sec. Now it's my turn. Okay, good night. Bye. Let's see. I don't know anything about you. I say you got fired from your job and have finally decided to write your novel. That's the sort of bullshit reason you'll find a man out in the woods. Good night. Welcome to the job. afternoon. <laughs> you probably slept like a rock. Anyway, uh, there's still a few hours of daylight to get some work in. I can see you at your desk, so call me when you're ready. Nels, it feels like you on the team did the most sort of digging about what the real job is like, what is in the actual space, and then checked us against reality when we kind of went off the reservation. I, I mean, I, in general, I really like doing research. I've kind of that's sort of a thing I've enjoyed on all the projects I've worked on. Um, so for this, a, a bunch of folks on the team read this great book called Fire Season by Philip Connors, which is kind of like a memoir-ish thing from this dude who it still is an active fire lookout even today um but i also just <laughs> i called up the, the ministry of forests and natural resources here in british columbia and got redirected to like three increasingly small ministry of forest offices until someone just gave me literally the phone number of this cool old lady who had once been a for uh, fire lookout so i just kind of chatted with her for like an hour and a half just about what doing the job was like the reason why the game is not a simulation of being a fire lookout is because what everyone talks about is that the number one challenge with the job is that it is incredibly impossibly boring because you you can't like read a book you can't like be doing other things right like not really yeah at, at the end of day three where delilah mentions it's like Kenny's like well what do i do for the rest of summer she's like you sit in that chair and you look out the window that is actually what fire lookouts really do so all the folks i talked to said like Figuring out ways to combat boredom is the number one thing. Uh, the lady I talked to, she said she did a whole lot of needlepoint and cross-stitch because you can do that without looking at your hands very much. <laughs> Obviously, like, lookouts are also responsible for doing, you know, maintenance on their towers. But again, it's like not maintenance because some crazy yahoo smashed up your tower it's maintenance like oh the paint is kind of flaking off better paint it or these trees have grown too tall so i need to chop them down not i'm chopping down trees to form a weird log bridge the main takeaway from whenever we would talk to someone who had done this job is 
why would you make a game about that? That is the most boring <laughs> time of my entire life. So uh, oh, hopefully yeah. uh, we showed them how. It feels like people who, who do this job like fall into two camps, right? They're the people who think they can do it and can't hack it and bail after like a month or two. You know, people like Jack Kerouac who tried to do this and wrote about it in Desolation Angels and then he he went crazy from a lack of cigarettes and then left. Or the people who kind of enjoy the solitude and then figure out ways to, to deal with it. But, you know, we, we do have like a lot of the window dressing for the stuff people use. Like <laughs> other folks I talk to, it's like, what do you do? Well, we read a lot of books and we like trade the books between the different lookouts through rangers and stuff like that. So, of course... Firewatch has a crap ton of weird books in it. <laughs> Stuff like that. 